Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Connecticut's Old State House. My name is Rebecca Tabor Conover. I'm head of public programs here, and it's great to have you with us today for our February conversation at noon. <clears throat> Today's program is focused on Connecticut's African Americans who served in the Civil War in celebration of African American Month. I do want to just mention that, as you can see, this program is being recorded and will be broadcast by the Connecticut Network. So please don't do anything that your mom wouldn't approve of while you're watching. And also, when you have a question at the end, I know Hamish is happy to take questions, please just wait till someone with a, micro, uh, with a microphone gets to you so that we can make sure to pick up what you're saying for the recording. I do want to invite you to join us in March when we continue our conversations at noon. We'll be posting information about those programs. And on your seat are surveys that we ask you to please fill out. We do actually read them and use them in planning. And if you aren't on our e-blast list, please put your email address on so we can be in touch with you and let you know about upcoming programs. It's always fun to have friends come to the old state house. And today I'm delighted to introduce our speaker, Hamish Lutris. And Hamish is an associate professor of history and political science at Capital Community College in Hartford. We kind of feel like he's our resident professor since Hamish has a class that meets here on American government on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And actually, there's a class at 1.15 today. So we'll be finishing up promptly at 1 and just ask if you have further conversation to step in the hall because we're going to do a quick change of this room and get it ready for our students coming. Hamish has worked in some of America's premier natural and historical sites, leading hiking and historical programs. He has also lectured extensively in the United States, Europe, and Canada, presenting programs on wide-ranging historical topics, including Native American history, the Civil War, scientific history, social and cultural history, World War I and World War II, and the American West. Please join me in welcoming Hamish today. Thanks, thanks. thanks a lot, Becca. Hi, folks. I, I, I just want to open up by saying that if you, if you do keep me here past 115, I don't think my students will really kick too much. You know, they'll probably be okay with that. But um, I, I did want to just say a couple of things before I uh, uh, start speaking. One is, uh, at the end, we will allow you time for question and answer, and we'll have a microphone ready for you, um, because they are recording the program. The other thing is, um, if you'd like to get up at some point, stretch your legs, uh, you know, you need to, to get out, maybe visit the restroom, please don't feel uh, like you're bothering me. I never vouch for your neighbors, but I'm okay with what you're doing. So, at any rate, folks, today, what we will be speaking about is actually one of the most interesting topics concerning the Civil War. In the Civil War, a lot of what we look at today is essentially the idea of the Civil War being the great crusade to expunge the national sin of slavery. And to that end, we uh, apparently, you know, we had talked today about having lost nearly a million people out of this country in the hopes that we could actually create a country that was more in line with what Thomas Jefferson said in his famous line in the Declaration of Independence, that all men are created equal. The fact of the matter is, though, folks, this is a very problematic subject for us as well. Because for the first couple of years of the war, it was absolutely and vehemently denied on the part of the North, especially, that the war had anything to do with African Americans or with slavery whatsoever. It's kind of interesting because you see a lot of wisdom on this uh, topic coming actually not so much from politicians, not from generals, but actually from people most affected by this, which were people generally either escaping from or in bondage, really had something to say about this. Now, in 1861, a slave uh, who had escaped from bondage crosses the lines, comes to, into the Union Army. Now, at this point, in 1861, it was Union Army policy when somebody who had escaped from bondage came into the lines to return that person to uh, the owner. And that was something that a lot of people really kind of had a problem with. And so this man comes in, right, and he says to a man named Benjamin Butler, I'll be speaking a little bit about General Butler today, one of the worst generals of the war, one of the best politicians of the war. It's kind of an interesting thing that we see. And he asked General Butler if he could sign up for the army. This guy had just escaped. And Butler said, I really don't know what to do with you. And he said, in fact, it's really what he said to the, the gentleman was, it's not a black man's war. And in response, 
what the, uh, what the uh, gentleman said to him was, I went to him and asked him to let me enlist, and he said it wasn't a black man's war. I told him it would be a black man's war before they got through. And the simple fact of the matter is, folks, the people who really saw the point of the Civil War most clearly were the people who were really in bondage, because really the African-American section of the country was extremely important in every single way. And one of the first ones was this. If we were going to be fighting a war against the South, the South had a population of 9 million people in 1861. Nearly half of those people are actually in bondage in 1861, a massive proportion of Southern population. In addition, that proportion of Southern population is overwhelmingly involved in one industry, and that industry was really the king industry in the United States, and that was the cotton industry. You want to remember, folks, in 1860, the United States South supplied the world with 80% of all of the cotton in existence. We were really in control of that entire trade. And so, when we talk about slavery being part of the war, being one of the base causes of it, this is something that everyone at the time was very aware of. In fact, in his second inaugural address, Abraham Lincoln said, slaves constituted a peculiar and powerful interest. All knew that this interest was somehow the cause of the war. Now, he's not the only one to say this. In fact, uh, among the Southerners, this is a very uh, uh, common point of view. Robert M. T. Hunter was actually a Secretary of State for the Confederate States of America. And actually what he said in 1861 is, what did we go to war for if not to protect our property? Everybody on the Confederate side basically said, yeah, you're trying to eliminate slavery and we're going to defend it. It was on the northern side that we had a much bigger problem with this because people were afraid that public opinion in the north would not support a war that was designed to free four and a half million people in the south they might support a war that was designed to answer the question of whether or not slaves, in essence, could get divorced from the United States. Now, for, or I'm, I'm sorry, slave states could get divorced from the United States. It's a little bit of a different meaning, folks. Sorry about that, it's, right? Now, as we go on, what we also find is that when we look at slavery, it's not simply in cotton that we find it. Slavery was deeply ensconced in every single aspect of American life. And just so that you understand this, folks, you're in Connecticut. Connecticut is one of the states that probably made more money from slavery than any southern state. And today, researchers are beginning to feel that places like Connecticut, strong insurance industry, and keep in mind, folks, we insured people who were plantation owners. We insured bales of cotton. We insured, in fact, the Hartford Insurance Company actually insured both Jefferson Davis's plantation in Mississippi and Abraham Lincoln's house in Springfield, Illinois. I always found this kind of interesting. And if we go beyond that, when we go into places in Connecticut and look at the industry here, and in 11 leading industries in the United States, folks, nine of them are going to be led by Connecticut. We look at what we were doing, and much of the trade that we had was going down south. Carriages from Bridgeport, sewing machines, insurance, as I said before, a lot of this is really servicing this huge money-making industry of cotton. Now, when Abraham Lincoln, therefore, comes into office, Abraham Lincoln might be saying that slavery was a part of the war in 1865, but when he gets in in the very beginning of the war, Abraham Lincoln evinces a fairly unsophisticated point of view on the role of the African American in society. Now, personally, Lincoln always felt that he did not like slavery. His family was Baptist, his mother and father were Baptist, they were anti-slavery from the beginning. Lincoln, as always, kind of humorous when he says it, right? When they asked him about what he thought about slavery, he said, when I hear anyone arguing for slavery, I feel a strong impulse to see it tried on him personally, right? And so, you know, Lincoln is really a guy who's looking at this as a person, but if you look at Lincoln when he is talking on a political stage, it is very different. In 1858, during the senatorial debates with, uh, with a man named Stephen Douglas, Lincoln said, I will say then that I am not 
nor ever have been in favor of bringing about in any way the social and political equality of the white and black races, at which point he stopped for applause. That I am not, nor ever have been in favor of making jurors or voters, or voters or jurors of Negroes, nor of qualifying them to hold office, nor to intermarry with white people. Now, Lincoln is going to go through a massive change in this attitude by 1864, but in 1858, He's going to say this, and this is really something that sits well with his audience in Illinois. It's not a slave state, but it's still a state that is highly, highly racist at the time. Also, when he gets into office in 1861, in his first inaugural, he says, there is no purpose, directly or indirectly, to interfere with slavery in the states where it exists. Lincoln was insistent that he was not going to touch slavery where it was, but that he would not allow it to expand. In fact, folks, because people were talking about seceding from the United States in 1860-61, by the time he gets into office, the Congress had actually prepared um, a, a series of amendments to the Constitution. Now, folks, if you're familiar with the 13th Amendment, many of you probably are familiar with the idea that the 13th Amendment ended slavery, that the 13th Amendment did not allow it except as a, a punishment for crime, in other words, kind of chain gang uh, uh, action, However, in March of 1861, the 13th Amendment to the Constitution would have looked something like this, and that is Article 1, I've only gotten part of it for you, Article 1 and 6, slavery of the African race is hereby recognized as existing and shall not be interfered with by Congress, but shall be protected as property by all the departments of the territorial government during its continuance. In other words, folks, slavery is here to stay, we're not going to change it, and and this is the part that Lincoln really got disturbed at. Lincoln was a lawyer. He was a great constitutional mind. Lincoln did not like the idea of Article 6, which said, no future amendment of the Constitution shall affect the five preceding articles. In other words, not only is slavery here to stay, but nobody in the future can make an amendment that gets rid of it. This, at this point for Lincoln, he said no. This really ties the hands of government, and we don't like this. I'm not signing this. But, folks, that's a very different 13th Amendment than the one that we are actually used to. And so, as we see, a lot of people were really willing to allow slavery to go on as long as it was going to naturally occur, as long as the country stayed together. Now, what's going to happen during uh, the Civil War, of course, is that this is all going to change. But, folks, you've got to understand, in 1861, when the Civil War begins, Lincoln is really thinking of two things, and these things are going to make him very hesitant to start using African Americans in any positive fashion. First, if we make a move towards slavery, he said, what we're going to do is if we outlaw it, we're going to find states like Maryland, Virginia, or I should say Kentucky, Tennessee, Missouri, Arkansas, these are known as border states. He said, if we outlaw slavery, these guys, Missouri and Kentucky especially, are probably going to secede from the country, and we're probably going to lose the war because the Confederacy will be right up on the Ohio River. Another reason that he was very unsure of what to do is because of this man. You might get the impression this is not an American, folks, all right? Um, yet the kilt generally tends to give it away. Um, this is actually a Scottish man who was the last royal governor of Virginia. And he was a royal governor of Virginia during the American War of Independence. His name is Lord Dunmore. Lord Dunmore, in 1775, made a proclamation. And this is something that really disturbed um, the people who were fighting on the side of the Americans. And later on, their memory is going to be fairly strong on this. And that is that Lord Dunmore's proclamation said that if any slave escaped from bondage and came into British lines, they would be given their freedom if they fought for the crown. Now, folks, the Americans really didn't like that too much because slavery was not only a going concern, but in 1775, African Americans constituted about 20% of the country, highest percentage we've ever seen. People were very afraid that this was going to lead to a very violent, bloody slave uprising. And so, in the end, something around 2,000 uh, uh, people in bondage are actually going to escape into the British lines. The truth is, about 800 of them will be used in what was called the Ethiopian Regiment. 
Um, but the fact is, most of them were actually going to die of disease or starvation before the end. And in the end, when the British left the country, they were going to leave these people pretty much to their fates. But the specter of slave uprising is going to be something that the southern United States especially is terrified of, right up into the Civil War. Now, there are other people who kind of look at this differently, right? Um, this, of course, is Frederick Douglass. And Frederick Douglass in his younger years. I, I always see Frederick Douglass in his older years with the beard. And I thought, it's good that we can look at this guy when he's kind of young and, you know, having some fun, right? Um, actually, what he said about the Civil War from the very beginning in 1861 is probably the most accurate summation of where it's all at. And he said, the Negro is the key to the situation the pivot upon which the whole rebellion turns. This war, disguise it as they may, is virtually nothing more or less than perpetual slavery against universal freedom. And he thinks this in 1861, he begins to advocate immediately for the arming of African Americans to actually help with the Union war effort. Now again, folks, one of the things you find is that in the beginning of the war, no one really wanted to do this. but. Even in the beginning of the war, people realized that slavery was really the root cause of it all. And so, by 1862, you have these kinds of political cartoons about Abraham Lincoln, that he's on a tightrope walking over the Niagara Falls, and what's on top of him is this whole question of slavery. In fact, the, the interesting thing is, there are all kinds of people in the country who said, yeah, actually, the whole Civil War is this nefarious plot by African Americans to upend the American government. And when you ask yourself, well, how did they get all that power in Washington? No one really answers you. They just kind of walk on, right? But we can see this, right? Now we're looking at a war that's increasingly becoming obvious that it really does involve um, the African American. Now, in 1862, Frederick Douglass says our presidents, governors, generals, and secretaries are calling with almost frantic vehemence for men. Men, men, send us men, they scream, or the cause of the Union is gone. And yet these very officers, representing the people in the government, steadily and persistently refuse to receive the very class of men which have a deeper interest in the defeat and humiliation of the rebels than all others. It's quite true, folks. 1861, 62, nobody on the northern side really wanted to see extensive African-American involvement in the war. Now, what begins to happen, however, is that slaves and ex-slaves, escaped slaves especially, begin to serve at a great role, even before the end of slavery and the Emancipation Proclamation, folks. Number one is that you have a lot of ex-slaves would escape into Union lines. Now, when they did, a lot of times what they would do is the official policy is going to be return, return people. But a lot of times what will happen, like with this kid, is basically the unit just kind of takes him on and makes him kind of a, you know, a, a dog's body, you might say, kind of a gopher for the unit, very often helping out with the cooks, let's say, possibly a servant for an officer. But then, you also have people coming into the lines who are actually full grown, very powerful, and they actually could serve as soldiers. You also have something else, and that is African Americans, especially uh, during the first couple of years of the war, serve as probably the most effective scouts and spies in the entire war. This is throughout the four years, folks. I'm going to tell you a very quick story. I won't take too long with this, but it's really worth hearing about. And that is in 1862, a man named Ambrose Burnside, commanding general of the Army of the Potomac, had brought his men to a place called Fredericksburg. Now, they were on one side of a river. The rebels are on the other side of the river. And they have no idea who's in front of them. Ambrose Burnside, uh, at that time, did not have a great intelligence gathering uh, um, arm around him. So he basically is looking across, and he sees people dressed in butternut and gray, but he doesn't know who they are or where they're from. And this guy comes into his office, and he and the generals are talking about this, and this man comes in, he's an escaped, right? He had escaped from bondage right over in Fredericksburg, and he comes over and he says, I can tell you who's in the uh, army over there. Everyone begins to laugh. How would you even know what a regiment is, they say. You know, like, you know, and then he starts talking. And you could hear people saying, geez, like, he's got all the commanders correct. He's got all the numbers correct. You know, 55th Mississippi. And they said, well, thank you very much for your time. They didn't listen to him, right? Now... A few days later, 
He comes back in. Now there's a lot more rebels up on the hillside. And he said, I can tell you who joined in the last couple days. And now the generals are listening to the guy because he's spot on. And so when he finishes, Burnside asks him, how'd you get this information? None of my men have any kind of detailed information like this. The guy says, oh, well, uh, my wife and I were over in Fredericksburg. I escaped, and she stayed over there. But now she's in the house where Robert E. Lee has his headquarters. So she actually serves them meals and coffee. And when she does, she, all she is is a slave. They speak quite openly in front of her about all their plans, about who's there. And then she developed a system on the laundry. The way she hung the sheets would tell you the numbers and tell you the commanders. It was the single most effective information gathering episode I have ever heard of in the Civil War. Information just didn't get tossed around that easily. So what you find is that escaped slaves were people that were going to be excellent for spies. They often helped escaped Union soldiers to get to freedom. They were very effective in this. In fact, even uh, Harriet Tubman, I'm sure you've probably heard the name. Harriet Tubman took a couple hundred Union soldiers behind the lines in South Carolina and really raised some heck bat in burning plantations, getting slaves freed. These people were very effective in this, right? But so far, no soldiers. Now, this is going to start changing. Two people, Charles Fremont, and this is one man in Missouri, and also David Hunter, who was down in Georgia, both tried to actually free enslaved peoples within their uh, jurisdiction and actually even arm them in Hunter's case. In both of these cases, Abraham Lincoln put the kibosh on it. He said, you can't do this. And the reason he said this was because the country is probably not going to be ready to accept people being armed, African Americans being armed to fight against the, the South. Now, Gideon Wells, native of Connecticut, um, who was actually the Secretary of the Navy during the war, began to soften this. Now, first of all, folks, in the U.S. Navy, the U.S. Navy didn't have any problems hiring African Americans. And not only did it actually take in African Americans, it gave them equal pay for equal work, and they had better food than the Army, and if you took a prize on the high seas, you got a piece of the action. So, actually, it's pretty smart to get into the Navy. Gideon Wells basically said, Right? It is not the policy of this government to invite or encourage this kind of desertion. And yet, under the circumstances, no other course could be adopted without violating every principle of humanity. To return them would be impolitic as well as cruel. You would do well to employ them. And here, you begin to find that African Americans filter into the lines and slowly they're going to be used in non-combatant ways. Now, for the most part, they're going to be used almost as they are by the South. The difference is that now they're going to be paid for their work. And so we will see people being used as laborers, stevedores, loaders, cooks, servants, all kinds of things. But really the change is going to come with this man. I mentioned it before, Benjamin Butler. Um, folks, if you're not too impressed with the way Benjamin Butler looks, don't worry about it. He's from Massachusetts. So we can say anything we want about the guy. He's also, very interestingly, a Democrat. And in uh, a Republican administration, very important. As a Democrat, he was made into a political general. And he's made into this so that um, the Democrats get some credit in the war. Now, Butler is, quite frankly, an abysmal general. I, I, to say that he was even on the battlefield was usually worth about 500 Union, union casualties. That was not going to be a good thing for you. However, as a politician, this man is sharp as a tack. And so in, in uh, 1861, the big change in the war will happen. Now, escaped slaves come over the lines, and a Confederate major who has seen his ex-slave over in the Union camp comes to Benjamin Butler and says, look, he says, my guy is over here. I want him returned to me as per Union policy. And Benjamin Butler says, I'm not returning him to you. The guy says, this is outrageous. And he says, no. He says, as a matter of fact, this man is contraband of war, and therefore I am hurting the Confederate war effort by taking him in, and I will take in as many freed slaves as I can get. This, I will tell you, is really something that Abraham Lincoln likes. Now, Abraham Lincoln doesn't want to go against public opinion, but contraband of war, ladies and gentlemen, we can now hurt the, the Confederate war effort. And so, Benjamin Butler is really the guy who puts us on the road to that idea of ending slavery altogether. 
1862 in July, the Second Confiscation Act is passed. And if you'll notice, now we get an implication that we might start using African Americans in the Army. Part of this act said to employ as many to employ as many persons of African descent as he may deem necessary and proper for the suppression of this rebellion in such manner as he may judge best for the public welfare. This doesn't say you're going to have African American soldiers, but it certainly does open kind of the gate to them. Now at this point, we don't really know what people are going to be used at, but here's where Lincoln is really the master. Lincoln never did anything precipitously. If you ask Lincoln how he was, Lincoln would probably form a committee and have them meet, and then he would tell you fine afterwards. He was the most careful speaker you can imagine, right? He is also a man who probably more than any other president had his finger on the pulse of the American public and did so absolutely accurately through the entire war. Now, in late 1862, after a victory at a place called Sharpsburg, Maryland, or the Battle of Antietam, the Emancipation Proclamation will be passed. Now, the Emancipation Proclamation is, again, this is pure Lincoln, folks. If you're familiar with the Emancipation Proclamation, you're probably aware that the Emancipation Proclamation did not free all slaves. It only freed slaves where Confederate power was in effect. And many people say, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Basically, you're going to say, I've got, I've got no power over there, but I'm going to pass a law for that area. Lincoln knew he was a lot smarter than that. He knew that if you put this down, that anyone who was a thinking politician would know that the writing was now on the wall. The end of slavery was coming. And anyone who didn't know it read this and still didn't know it. Eh, that was going to be to their cost. The fact of the matter is, folks, on January 1st, 1863, for the first time, really since about the War of 1812, African Americans will not only be free if they were under Confederate power, they will also be invited to join the Union Army. In the end, some 186,000 African American men will join the Army. Another 20,000 or so will be in the Navy. And they are going to do signal service for the United States. Now, when this is passed, folks, a lot of people at first are going to have horrible reactions to this. Just so that you can see this, Lincoln has prepared the ground quite carefully. People are predicting mass desertions from the Union Army. But Lincoln's been working on this for so long now and talking about it that actually when it does come, it's not as big of a shock as you would have thought. And again, Lincoln knows how to do things incrementally. And so the Norwich Aurora on January 1st, 1863, when the Emancipation Proclamation takes effect, says, this act of Lincoln's is the culmination of his stupidity. It changes the whole character of war by making one of its aspects the abolition of slavery. And folks, if you think that's kind of rude toward Lincoln, believe me, I could have produced 20 or 30 that were a lot worse than this. Um, if you think the press has gotten really rude in the last few years, let me bring you back 150 or so. You might see something different. Now, the Hartford Current, which was a Republican newspaper on January 2nd, had a very different view. It said, now for the first time in its history, the government stands unequivocally committed to the support of the fundamental principles on which it was originally founded. So there's a mixed opinion in the war, but as the war goes on, that public opinion is going to turn toward freeing slaves, not away from it. So we will see over and over again that Lincoln has played this masterfully. And so, as I said, about 186,000 uh, uh, African Americans are going to join up with the Union Army. Another 20,000 or so will join the Union Navy. And as I said before, Union Navy is really a little bit better. Everybody gets equal pay, do pretty well with it. You can go around the world. And in Connecticut, folks, one of the things you find is that a lot of the African-American population in 1860, which was about 9,000 in 1860, out of a population of 450,000, a lot of folks were located down on the coast. New London, uh, uh, New Haven, Groton, places where the maritime trades were big. And this is really the original African-American populations of Connecticut were way down in that area. And again, seafaring populations. So it's kind of natural that you would see this. But we would also see African Americans fairly quickly, they're going to be put in behind the lines uh, duty. Things like this, as I said before, stevedores, loaders, cooks, provost duty, where they're going to be guarding things like artillery trains. Not high in danger at this time, 
but nobody really knows yet how African Americans are going to perform in battle. There hasn't been really time to, to train them. There hasn't been time to really see the performance. But we will see, as time goes on, that more and more African Americans are going to be joining up and that actually the performance of African Americans, and I'm just really showing you a few pictures of, of various African Americans who served and then had photographs taken of them. I wanted to show you this guy, right? Um, a lot of these folks are unnamed. Even the photographers don't know who they are. Um, yes, uh, so you get a lot of people who are joining up, surgeons. Um, you do have a few people who do rise in rank. Um, but what you're looking at right now, folks, is pretty much the same kind of tin-type postcard that any Union soldier would have made. They're going to get these. They put them on tin, and they can give them out almost like business cards to people who are important to you. All right, so we see all over the place, right? Soldiers are going to begin to join up, and in places like Louisiana, South Carolina at first, because these have large African-American populations, regiments are going to begin to rise. They're going to be raised, and we're going to start using them, actually. And fairly soon, we're going to start using them in battle. So again, I like this one best, because the guy and his, his family always like that. I don't know about you, but I can't imagine sitting for 30 seconds, right? I always wonder, not so much the adults, but the kids, like what they're doing, like, I can't wait. You know, have you ever tried to stand 30 seconds still with your kid? You know, so I think we understand. But what we will find is that African-American performance in the war was pretty much about on a par with white performance. This is one of the big points of the war, folks. It's a very mundane point to make. But the fact of the matter is, when you're looking at the percentage of men who signed up, the percentage of men who got medals, the percentage of men who ran away, the percentage of men who had to be drafted as opposed to, be, to joining up themselves, what you will find is that there's really statistically hardly any difference between African American and, and white performance in the war. The two areas where you will find significant difference, and many people believe this to be a function of the lack of training time, is that a lot more African Americans will die of disease. And in fact, that is going to push their mortality rate up fairly high. Um, the other thing that you will find is that African Americans had one thing about fighting in the war that was very, very, uh, well, much more serious for them than for white soldiers. And that is, you never knew what was going to happen if you ended up surrendering. Now, first of all, folks, if you surrendered and you were a white soldier, it was the duty of the person capturing you to keep you alive. And people held to this. However, it, it was the rebel policy to take any African American they found when they would win a battle and advance and find people to sell them into slavery and then down into the Deep South, Mississippi, Alabama. Now, folks, if you're going to capture a soldier and you're going to send him down to a plantation, this is a guy who knows how to use a gun. He's been trained on how to fight. And this is a guy who does not have any fear. This is a very dangerous man to send down on a plantation. And the rebels really are going to start killing people really pretty quick. I don't mean to sound really rude when I say this, but at first the, um, the southern policy was that any African-American caught with a gun or in uniform was considered an enemy uh, 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 spy and they were to be put to death immediately. Now, Abraham Lincoln answered this policy by saying, if you do that, fine then we will kill one Confederate officer for each African-American you kill. Now, that kind of quieted the, the question for a little while, but there were still some incidents, where, especially at Fort Pillow, Tennessee in 1864, where African-Americans who surrendered were openly slaughtered. And this, we still don't know the real truth of Fort Pillow, but we do see this over and over again, folks. So we will see that there are a great many things facing these soldiers, but Beginning in 1862 and beginning going into 1863, soldiers fighting as African Americans are going to attain actually a very good war record. You're probably aware, right, in 1863, very famous uh, charge of the 54th Massachusetts against Fort Wagner. Now, <clears throat> what we find here is that this was really something glorified by a, a movie. And so it does tend to be a little more famous for us. But we also do tend to find that throughout the war, African Americans surprised their enemies a great deal by being really steadfast. Of course, if you think you might be executed on capture, you're probably going to be well motivated to fight as well. But what we find is that you also have a bunch of guys, and I get different numbers on this, folks. Uh, if any of you have one, you can comment afterwards. 
Um, I've gotten numbers of 16, 20, and then over 20 as far as African Americans who won the Medal of Honor during the war. Um, this is just one man. His name is Albert Christian Hammond. Um, same, uh, same gentleman. Just wanted to show you kind of a full-length portrait of him. Um, but there's a great deal of bravery shown by these men uh, and a great deal of accomplishment. It is also interesting that to many people, this 10% of the entire Union Army, that they really put a lot of the Union victories over the top. So the Union Army is actually quite satisfied with this. So satisfied that actually the Confederates began talking about using African Americans in battle as well. Beginning in 1863, um, in the Confederate Congress, one of the congressmen said this, the time has come for us to put into the Army every able-bodied Negro man. He mu I lo always love this. He must play an important part in this war. He caused the fight, and he will have his portion of the burden to bear. And you think to yourself, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, you know. I, I don't know about you, but that's a great conspiracy theory. That there's this kind of underground, you know, we're going to cause these guys to have a civil war. It's fantastic when you see this. Folks, if you've ever heard that the Civil War is not about slavery, you're generally looking at an idea first put forward by Jefferson Davis in the 1880s. This is the idea of states' rights. But if, you, if anyone ever tells you that, just ask them what they, had, what they were arguing about the right to do, right? There's only one thing they were arguing about the right to do. It's quite, quite interesting when we see this, right? Now, General Patrick Cleburne in 1863 almost skewers his own career when he comes out, one of the most effective battlefield commanders of the war, and he actually says, we should start training African Americans to fight for the Confederacy. And he says, not only that, but if they fight well, we should give them their freedom. This didn't go over well. And he said, will the slaves fight? The experience of this war so far has been that half-trained Negroes have fought as bravely as half-trained Yankees. And you, you look at it and you realize a lot of these guys on the battlefield knew exactly what they, were, um, what they were looking at. Robert E. Lee, in fact, says, I recommend that we immediately commence training a large reserve of the most courageous of our slaves and further, that we guarantee freedom within a reasonable time to every slave in the South who shall remain true to the Confederacy in this war. Seems a little bit odd, folks, right? But it did cause a lot of uh, debate. And when Robert E. Lee said this, the Confederacy actually pretty much had to take it seriously. Believe it or not, two companies of ex-slaves were actually raised in uh, the Confederacy. They were used in late March 1865. They were marched into line. Then they were marched out of line. And that's pretty much the only action of Confederate African Americans during the war. Most people thought this. And this is a man named Louis Wigfall. So, Senator from Texas, he said, I think that the proposition to make soldiers of the slaves is the most pernicious idea that has been suggested since the war began. You cannot make soldiers of slaves or slaves of soldiers. The day you make a soldier of them is the beginning of the end of the revolution, and if slaves seem good soldiers, then our whole theory of slavery is wrong. Now, you might agree with that. Uh, you might not come down on the same side, but it is quite interesting to see this. The Confederates were very clear about what they were fighting for and about what was at stake here. So what's interesting is today, even today, there are actually people that will tell you that up to 80,000 African Americans fought for the Confederacy. It's really kind of interesting to hear. Um, total, you know, it, it doesn't make much sense. However, you find a lot like this, folks. If you look at the picture on the right, this is the first Louisiana Native Guard. You notice the officer on the left-hand side of that picture? He's a Union officer. But later on, when they wanted to make it seem like this is Louisiana Confederates, what they simply did was what we would do, Adobe Photoshop, right? And they just went in, cut it out, and everything is OK now. But we'll see this all over the place. You see this kind of thing, too. Man comes into battle with his servant, right? And the servant, he's given some cast off Confederate clothing, right? There is also one man who said that he was actually in the Stonewall Brigade and that he actually scouted for the Confederates during the Civil War. Um, but we don't really know much about him. But the simple fact is, folks, it is very rare to hear that any African American actually even thought seriously about fighting for the Confederacy. 200 or so marched out to a battlefield and then back out of four, four and a half million people in bondage. It's, it's not a very high percentage, obviously. Now, in Connecticut, we actually did raise a regiment and a half. That's about 1,400 or so soldiers who were going to be uh, created into an African-American 
uh, uh, unit. Now, the 29th Connecticut Colored Volunteer Infantry is one. The other one is about half of what is called the 30th Connecticut Colored uh, Volunteer Infantry. They become folded into the 31st U.S. Colored Volunteer Infantry. So really, it's the 29th that we're looking at, folks. And at the time, at first, this is William Buckingham, the governor of Connecticut during the Civil War. Buckingham actually was very hesitant to use slaves for the same reason that Lincoln was. Lincoln was a very disciplined Republican operative and basically said to the governors, be careful what you do because we don't want to push public opinion too far. And so when asked to raise an African-American regiment, Buckingham says, it seems to me the time may yet come when a regiment of colored men may be profitably employed. But now if a company should be introduced in a regiment, a regiment into a brigade, more evil than good will result. However, in 1863, this man, Colonel William B. Wooster, who was the commander of the 20th Connecticut Infantry, is actually going to request to head up a new regiment of African Americans. This is going to be something that a lot of um, uh, officers will get into, folks, because if you are a captain in an all-white unit, you might be a colonel in an African American unit. And this is going to be something people kind of think about a lot. Now, Wooster takes this idea of advancement, and here he will command the 29th Connecticut Colored Volunteer Infantry. And you see him right here in South Carolina. Now, the um, 29th Infantry is kind of interesting. When the 29th Infantry is raised, it's raised mainly in New Haven. And actually, uh, this is just the belt buckle for the, the 29th Connecticut Volunteers, right? And they're going to be trained over at Cruscuolo Park, which is in East Haven, Connecticut. This is actually the monument to the 29th Connecticut. Now, they're going to be raised here, and finally, they're going to be kind of uh, uh, in the fall of 1863, they're finally going to have enough men that they can form the regiment, and they are going to be marched down south in order to uh, join the units there. Now, at this point, folks, you begin to find out the real difference between white and African-American units in the Civil War. Um, white soldiers were paid $13 a month, and they had a $3 uniform allowance taken out, or taken out of that. In other words, they get the grand total of about $10 a month which is not bad. I'm sure you're all a little bit jealous of this right now. Um, just so you know, folks, they did not have to pay taxes either to the U.S. or to Connecticut. And if anyone out here is in politics, it's just a small suggestion that, you know, we might, we might follow suit. However, um, African-American soldiers were given $10 a month and then given a $3 uniform allowance, thus putting them $3 down. Until June 1864. In June 1864, African-American soldiers basically went on strike. They would not do anything until they received equal pay, and they did. The government was really unable to get on without them, and it did give them equal pay. Another thing that's going to happen to the 29th is that the 29th will be promised bonuses. Now, folks, in 1863-64, uh, if you joined up the Union Army, you might get a bonus. If you joined here, for instance, you might get a Hartford bonus, you might get a Hartford County bonus, you might get a Connecticut bonus, you might get a U.S. bonus. It's not bad. You could end up getting a couple hundred bucks by joining up. And in fact, uh, there's all kinds of stories of people joining up, getting the bonus, deserting, joining up in the next town. One guy in Connecticut did it 14 different times. Yeah, I, I, I tip it in my hat. If I had a hat, I'd tip it to the guy. That's all right. However, what happens to these soldiers is that they are not given the bonus. They're given the U.S. bonus, but they're not given the New Haven County bonus. And so, in November of 1863, when they're presented with the flags, and these are the flag, this is actually the flag, it's now in the state capitol, being renovated, but when they're given these flags, actually the men of the 29th will turn their backs on the ladies of New Haven, and they will not be ordered by their commander to turn around and honor people because they felt that they had really been kind of slighted when um, they got the, the lesser amount of money. So they were given the flags, and they actually went down to South, uh, South Carolina for a while. When they get to South Carolina, they're given a speech by this man. This is, again, Frederick Douglass, but now we can see a little bit older. Um, and he says, you are the pioneers of the liberty of your race. With the United States cap on your head, the U.S. eagle on your belt, the U.S. musket on your shoulder, not all the powers of darkness can prevent you from becoming American citizens. There's the center of it, folks. This is why you didn't want African Americans in the Army. 
because if they served and served well, they would prove to you beyond a shadow of a doubt that they deserved all of the full rights of citizenship and people were very loath to give them to them. This includes Connecticut, and I'll, I'll mention that at the very end. And not for yourselves alone are you marshaled. You are pioneers on you, the destiny of four millions of the colored race in this country. And so, these men were really kind of the groundbreakers. Now, they're gonna go to South uh, Carolina, they're gonna be um, trained for some months, they're gonna be given weapons and then officers, and then they will be put into the line. And so, as we look at just a couple of people, we don't get many written accounts of the 29th, but this is one man. Uh, this is Alexander Newton, who is one of the um, uh, chaplains of the unit. And Newton actually said, although freeborn, I was born under the curse of slavery. Newton was born in Pennsylvania, actually. So he wasn't an ex-slave, he didn't escape from bondage. But he was born under the curse of slavery, surrounded by the thorns and briars of prejudice, hatred, persecution, and the suffering incident to this fearful regime. We can see a few other people too. Isaac Hill is a, an orderly to Colonel Wooster, and Isaac Hill and Newton are two of the people who actually write accounts of their time in the 29th Connecticut. Um, Isaac Newton wrote this, a sketch for the 29th Connecticut. Just so you know this, folks, um, I, I actually might be able to, to do something about this later, but this is actually on the Connecticut Historical Website, uh, Historical Society website. It's a PDF file, so you can just download it if you'd like to. And it's really actually a very eye-opening account because Hill pulls no punches. When he talks about prejudice, it's actually quite interesting to see how openly and fiercely, uh, fiercely he talks about it. But he says this, at 10 o'clock, the whole regiment was drawn up on the old parade ground, and here's your flag incident. With their knapsacks to receive the flag, Colonel William B. Wooster in command, the flag was presented by the Reverend Dr. Mott. On account of the regiment not receiving the $75 which was promised them at their enlistment, they made no response to the presentation, and the Colonel gave them no command to do so. These folks are pretty tough-minded. They know exactly what they're getting into, and they're going to perform quite well under the circumstances. Now, the 29th is really going to perform um, mainly in this area of Virginia during the war, and mainly right down here a little bit southeast of Virginia. And both the 29th and 30th are going to be involved in what is called the Overland Campaign, the very end of it. Now, this campaign begins in May of 1864, and it kind of marches down from about almost the Maryland border right down to outside of Richmond in a place called Petersburg. Now, the summer of 1864, folks, just so you understand this, was the bloodiest summer we had ever seen as a nation. More men died in this, like, two-month campaign that had died in all of the campaigns of the war that far put together. This is bloody. So the African-American soldiers are going to be very welcome when they come down here. Now, in front of Petersburg, what's going to happen is that modern warfare begins. Really, it does. Because here, the two sides are going to set up in trenches, and they're just going to snipe away at each other for about nine months until the taking of Petersburg in April of 1865. This is pretty much what the entrenchments at Petersburg look like. Just thought I might show them to you. Very rough, very rude, and I will tell you, folks, when you go to a, a war like Vietnam, let's say, um, after a while of active service, you might get pulled off the line to rest and recuperate. They didn't really do that in the Civil War. Guys were just basically left on the line until they either broke, were wounded or killed, or they emerged victorious. So what's going to happen here? And this is the main uh, action that you're going to find African-American troops involved in, and that is um, they're going to take a great deal of explosives, and there's a unit called the 48th Pennsylvania. It's made up of all coal miners. And what they're going to do is they're going to dig a shaft under the, the rebel lines, stuff it full of TNT, and literally just blow the rebel lines to pieces. It's actually interesting. The shaft that you see is the longest horizontal shaft ever laid in coal mining up until that date, all done by hand by these miners. Now, what's going to happen is that a, an African-American unit, the 30th Connecticut, combined and into the 31st, is going to be trained that when they blow this up, they're going to be trained to exploit this. They're going to be trained by this man. His name is Edwin Ferrero. Now, folks, if you're not familiar with Ferrero, um, that's really too bad. He was the greatest dance instructor of the 19th century. Had a whole line. He was your Arthur Murray of the 1860s. 
actually had a whole line of dance studios all across the country, believe it or not. Now, you can kind of tell when I'm stressing his dance instructor background, not the greatest military commander, but really close to his troops. And what he had trained the 31st to do, this is very important, is that when you blew up the line, there was going to be a big hole here. So he trained his troops to come in and then split up and go around the hole. The last thing you wanted to do is get into the bottom of a bomb pit, folks, because you can't get out. So basically, there you would be trying to climb out, and just, people can just shoot you. Now, this is really the interesting part of it. He's got his men all ready to go, all right? And then he's going to get overridden. His, his command will be overridden by this man, James Ledley. Folks, have you ever heard the term the Peter Principle? Yes, you rise as high as your incompetence will take you. James Ledley was a man who never saw a day's battle until the Overland Campaign. He had basically risen through the ranks as a staff officer, doing research work, orderly work, right? Now, the other thing about Ledley was that you may not have heard of Ledley. The only reason you would know Ledley is if you knew the history of the worst alcoholics in U.S. history, because Ledley was known as one of the worst drunks in either army. Uh, he spent a lot of time during that overland campaign in what they called the medicine wagon. That is, basically stretched out in an ambulance, passed out on whiskey, while his men were fighting and dying. And Ledley basically says, we're not going to bring in the 31st the first time. When we blow that hole, he says, I'm not going to send them in first. I'm going to send a white unit in first, right? Now, what happens is that they are actually going to blow it up. This is what the Confederate lines at Petersburg look like after this happens. The men, when this explosion occurs, the crater is something like a half mile wide, and the men uh, of the rebel side just run away. And so right at the beginning of this, you have about a two-mile gap in the rebel lines. Everyone's just run off because they don't know what's going to happen next. But rather than send in his trained units first, he basically will send in a white unit before them who's never really dealt with how to get around a bomb pit. And the first thing they do is go right into it, and then the 31st comes right after them. And the, look, the rebel army, like them or not, they were a very good, hard-hitting army. And what they did was after their initial shock, they came back, and for them, they all said, this is basically like shooting ducks in a barrel, folks. And that's what they did. The 31st was torn to pieces by this. Now, after the action, um, basically, Major General Henry G. Thomas, who was one of the men leading the charge, said, the men of the 31st making the charge were being mowed down like grass, with no hope of anyone reaching the crest, so I ordered them to scatter and run back. The 31st had been so shattered, was so diminished, so largely without officers that I got what was left of them out of the way of the charging column as much as possible. Basically, the unit ceased to exist, folks, on that day. Exceptionally brave action, very uh, stalwart men, but they are going to be wiped out. And when Ulysses Grant talks about this afterwards, he says, this was my order, not to send the African Americans in first. And he says, General Burnside wanted to put this colored division in front, and I believe if he had done so, it would have been a success. I agree with General Meade in his objection to that plan. General Meade said that if we put the colored troops in front, we had only that one division, and it should prove a failure, it would then be said, and very properly, that we were showing those, shoving those people ahead to get killed because we did not care anything about them. But that could not be said if we put white troops in front. Now, folks, you really can really come down with your own judgment on this. Nobody's really certain about what this was. It is an interesting point that he makes, but at the same time, they had been specially trained for this task. And so what we find is that after this battle, the, um, the 29th actually continued on. The 31st did, but in much diminished fashion. But uh, both of these units were going to see very good service. And in fact, on April 2nd, 1865, it was the 29th Connecticut that was the first unit for the Union Army into Richmond, Virginia. They were the first ones to actually go in and occupy the city. Now, after that, the, uh, the 29th was actually sent down to Texas. And there, they basically did uh, garrison duty, making sure that there were no flare-ups of the rebellion. They were going to do that until about November of 1865, at which point they were brought back to uh, New Haven and they were disbanded. Now, at this point, folks, this is what's interesting. Um, at, in 1865, the Union Army basically took over control of the southern United States. 
and Reconstruction begins. And when it does, between 1865 and 70, every southern state had to accept African American suffrage, the vote, in order to come back into the Union. Connecticut did not actually have African American men voting until 1871, after every other southern state had already awarded it. So there's really not much that we can say about being really kind of on the cutting edge of being enlightened. And in fact, one person writing about the 29th said the poor rights of a soldier were denied them. Their actions were narrowly watched and the slightest faults severely commented upon. In spite of all this, the Negro soldier fought willingly and bravely. And with his rifle alone, he had vindicated his manhood and stands confessed today as second in bravery to none. Now just to kind of uh, close out my, my talk, last couple of uh, minutes here, um, after this, I really believe that most of these African-American soldiers knew very well what they were getting into. They knew very well that they were not going to receive full equal treatment when they got home from war, that they were only really blazing a path that others might follow, their children, their grandchildren, possibly even their great-grandchildren. And of course, we still think about this idea of equality in our society today. Now, Isaac Hill was surprisingly forgiving about all this. He said, the author's desire and prayer is that tranquility and peace and happiness may cover the earth as the waters cover the great deep. Frederick Douglass was a little bit different about that. Um, Frederick Douglass said the real question, the all commanding question, is whether American justice, American liberty, American civilization, American law, and American Christianity can be made to include and protect alike and forever all American citizens. It is whether this great nation shall conquer its prejudices, rise to the dignity of its professions, and proceed in the sublime course of truth and liberty marked out for itself during the late war, or shall swing back to the ancient moorings of slavery and barbarism. And of course, folks, we're really not sure even about that today. So we're continuing on that adventure as we go. Well, folks, that's my presentation for today. i really like to thank you for coming out and, and seeing it. If you have any questions or comments, love to hear them at any time. That, oh, thank you. Um, please. Maybe a comment. Oh, thank you. Maybe a comment. Uh, you read from uh, the quote from the Lincoln-Douglas debate where Lincoln right. said, he wasn't for African-Americans voting. Right. Seven years later, his last speech to a crowd outside the White House, he right. spoke to maybe it's time right. to give African-Americans, especially those who served in the war, exactly. the right to vote. Yeah. One of the things about Lincoln that I've always found personally most impressive is that he really seemed to transform during the war. In 1862, there was, I'm not quoting you literally here, but in 1862, he had a meeting with um, uh, African-American religious leaders and basically said, I don't think we can really live together. Meanwhile, he's got the Emancipation Proclamation in his pocket. I'm not sure where Lincoln quite was, and, and I'll be honest with you, nobody knows where Lincoln ever was. He never told anyone what he thought. But I agree with you, I think he was coming around to that point very soon. I think we would have probably have seen more forceful action toward it but again, that was a, a story cut off on April 14th, 1865. Well, please. Oh, you need that? There you go. Thank you. I think so. It's more of a statement that I read recently. We must confront the paradox of people achieving freedom in one century and still seeking it in the next. Thank yeah, you. actually, I, I have you. to say, yeah, thank you very much. I, I have to say the, uh, the accuracy of the statement is undeniable. Um, and if you think about it, one of the things that in 1944, there was a gentleman named Gunnar Myrdal. Now, a lot of people didn't notice it because we're in the middle of World War II, right? So you don't see it. But Myrdal said that in reality, the, civil, the whole civil rights struggle, he said, in a way is kind of ridiculous because we've already got every law on the books that we need to ensure that all people in the country will be treated equally. We just don't enforce them. Or if we do enforce them, we don't enforce them equally, right? This is really the thing is that we're still trying to make good on that thing about the Gettysburg Address, right? That we said it was all about freedom, is it? Please. Public policy. Yeah contrary to what happened. Oh, yeah. 
Well, the thing about this is, too, it's not so much the policy as the enforcement of the policy. For instance, if you're talking about a literacy test in order to be able to vote, I might say to you, how do you spell cat? Or I might say to you, how do you spell chrysanthemum? Um, it's not going to be the same answer that I would get, obviously. So uh, with a lot of it, you seeing that even today, that a lot of people feel that really hasn't been approached as true equality even today. Thank you. I, I can take one more, please. Could, could you tell me again where the 29th trained? And I have oh, one more. Sure, it's called Cruscuolo Park, and that's in East Haven, Connecticut. Um, oh, sorry, yeah, <laughs> C-R-U-S-C-U-O-L-O. And right. also, um, we had heard that uh, someone named Norton was also a white person as an officer in the, of the 29th. Could be. Have you heard of him? Um, no, but actually, you had a lot of white officers in the black units. Most of the ones over lieutenant were going to be. Um, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to think of numbers. Most of uh, everyone over the rank of lieutenant was going to be white. You did have 7,000 officers made from African Americans during the war. You know, so, all right. Well, thank you very much, folks. It's really nice of you to come out on such a day. Have a great day. Thank you again.